Tucked near the heart of Estero. Have you been here before? No. Oh, oh, wow. Is Koreshin State Park that has a history so unusual you have to hear it to believe it. This was built in 1905. This is where they worshipped. So to learn more about this land and the people who lived here and inspired the name, let me go see if we can get in. We took a tour with Florida Gulf Coast University professor Lynn Milner, who wrote a book about the Koreshin Unity Settlement. This is his original um, pulpit. It was started by a man named Cyrus Teed, whose first name translates to Koresh in Persian. He was a doctor of eclectic medicine, and he believed that he was a messiah sent to redeem humanity. Milner says by the late 1800s, Teed had convinced a group of the same thing, and eventually they all began living together in a mansion in Chicago. And then he started uh, having trouble with creditors. You know, there were bills to pay. And he started having trouble with husbands who were angry with him because their wives had left them to join Cyrus Teed. And those troubles led Teed to Southwest Florida. He hears about some land in Florida and he comes down to see it and that land did not pan out. But what did pan out was that there was an old German homesteader who had come to homestead this land in the 1880s and that homesteader had lost everything. According to Milner, it didn't take long for T to convince that homesteader, Gustav Domkohler, that he was the messiah. Soon after, Teed and his Chicago following moved down, took over, and began building. And you see some artifacts there. Leading us back here to the art hall. It holds information central to the Koreshian belief system, and Milner says it gave followers comfort at a time when the world felt confusing. So he did that, he had his religio science, and then he had this, and this is a perfect symbol of how God wouldn't create anything we couldn't understand. The entire universe is contained inside of a hollow earth. We stand on the edges of that, looking in at the sun, the moon, the planets, the entire cosmos, and there's just nothingness outside. Research shows that the community also believed they'd achieve immortality through celibacy and live forever in utopia here. I love this house. And all over the 200 acre property is evidence of the hard work that believers put in toward that plan. It included building out a home for Teed that doubled as a school. His door was decorated with tusks. And a dental office. There was also a planetary court where seven women who were appointed to leadership within the settlement actually lived. I'd like to think this is exactly what it looked like, right? But I'm, I'm sure it didn't. At their height, the Koreshians were 250 strong and self-sustaining under Teed's leadership until he died in 1908. They believed he was coming back to life. And when Teed inevitably did not come back, the numbers started to dwindle. But Milner says a new book called Waco by author Jeff Quinn shows that Teed did live on in an unexpected way. So these believers hung on. Um, they were declining, they were aging. And some of them in the 30s wrote a book called Koreshanity and it laid out Cyrus Teed's credentials and his major beliefs. Now somehow, in the 1980s, this book made its way to the Waco McClellan Public Library. According to Gwyn's new book, David Koresh of the Branch Davidian religious sect got his inspiration from Teed without realizing he was plagiarizing. His tongue is the pin of a... So how's God going to talk to me in the latter day? He was apparently fed the information by a lover without knowing the source. No excuses! Koresh's predecessor, a woman named Lois Roden, had been cribbing from Cyrus Teed for years some of his philosophies and prophecies. That's what made her the leader. And David Koresh, almost word for word, he is the lamb, he is going to do all these wonderful things, straight from Cyrus Teed in Estero, Florida. And according to this new information, David Koresh only found out about Teed and that book during the deadly 1993 Waco siege. When I started going through the negotiator tapes between the FBI and David Koresh, the conversations they were having, I noticed a couple pages in the transcript, 60,000 pages, but in two of them in particular, where the FBI mentioned 
that they had a book about another Koresh. The FBI said, this seems like it's, you're just taking a page from this guy Cyrus Teed. Some of this is straight out of Teed. He's like, send it in. The FBI never sent the book in. And I believe that if they had, lives would have been saved. Milner says it's a connection and legacy that should serve as a reminder to all of us to step outside of ourselves and our own beliefs and to listen to others, especially when we don't agree. So when we identify another group that doesn't necessarily agree with what we believe, there needs to be uh, more conversation. Right now, what's happening is just total dismissal. In Estero, with photojournalist Josh Whitston, I'm in-depth reporter Rochelle Aline.